I believe you can answer your own data analysis questions. Do you? If you do, stick around for this week's edition of Code Club. I'm your host, Pat Schloss, and my goal each week is to help you to grow in confidence in your own data analysis skills to ask and answer questions about the world around us using data. A couple of weeks ago, my wife conned our 15-year-old Joe into rototilling a big section of our pig pen so that she could have a garden in it this year. She's been very ambitious this year in planting this garden. Uh, the garden has grown from being very small to very large and even larger. So a number of years ago, I tried to create a garden uh, that was monumental. I figured, I have a big tractor, I'm going to have a big garden. It was way too big once the weeds started popping up. Anyway, like every other family this year, we're thinking about gardening too. So, uh, nevertheless, my wife got Joe to rototill the garden that I can kind of see out my window here of my office, uh, a big area, and she started planting it little by little. Um, and it's been helped along this week um, because we had, we had a bunch of rain the last few days uh, where we're at here in southern Michigan. Um, another thing that we've got going on this spring is that I've got about 20 apple trees in the front along our driveway that are starting to blossom. Um, so you can start seeing the petals. But I'm kind of a worrier <laughs> and I worry about uh, late season frost. In the last Code Club I talked about how cold it was a couple Saturdays ago where it was just like, you know, historically cold weather. Well, is it going to be cold again, and will it kind of kill my wife's tender plants or kill my, my tender apple tree blossoms so we don't get any produce in the fall? We don't know, right? Well, a normal person might go to a website um, uh, to, to, to figure these things out where uh, you could do a Google search for your town or your city uh, with frost date, and they would tell you uh, what date uh, you're safe uh, transplanting plants or having plants after a certain date and that you're very unlikely to get any kind of frosts. Um, the, the one that, that we had, I, th I found, I think was called like gardening in the mitten. Um, I have it in, in the, the web page version of this code club, but you could go to that website and they will tell you, you know, you know, what's the last date that you would expect a frost uh, in the spring and what's the, what's the earliest you would expect a frost in the fall so that you would know that your garden is basically done for the year if you hadn't already given up uh, and gotten overrun by weeds. So, you know, a normal person, like I said, would go look at one of these websites, but friends, we are not normal people. We've got computers, <laughs> we've got data. So why don't we use that data to answer the question ourselves, building on some of the skills that we've been working with over the last few weeks in Code Club. Um, and so we'll be able to use that same data that I shared with you last week from a NOAA weather station that uh, is located in Ann Arbor, Michigan on the University of Michigan campus, has data going back to 1891. And so we'll learn about uh, a new function called mutate, which we've actually seen in previous code clubs, but I've never really talked about. And we'll use it with functions that were our good friends at this point, filter, group by, and summarize, to answer this question about frost date uh, here in southeastern Michigan, where perhaps you could get your own data from where you're from to answer the same question, but for, for your region. In the exercises, we'll take that idea and you'll be able to take it on to look at other questions. Um, I'm going to look at the, the early frost date. You'll look at the late frost date. Uh, there's also a rule of thumb that I've heard recently that if the low temperature and the high temperature for the day combine to be greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then you'll have uh, good grass growth. So I've got a lot of sheep and cows and it's important to me that this grass starts growing because I'm sick of paying to pay, feed them hay. So if the grass starts growing that would be great. So when can I expect each year that the grass will start growing? So these are the types of questions that we'll be able to answer after today's Code Club. So again at the Code Club website on this page uh, titled So Cold and Dexter, um, we're going to go down to the prompt and you can see that we have this section here, this first code chunk uh, in the gray box. And I'm going to go ahead and copy this over into our studio into a new R script. I'll go ahead and save this uh, as uh, so cold in Dexter dot R. It's my R script. If I run the whole thing, 
everything loads eventually <laughs> AA weather and we get to see the data frame that we worked with a lot last week uh, you can also learn more about this data set by going to my general R materials that are also linked at the top right corner of the Riffamonis website we spend about five sessions going through uh, analyzing these weather data using different tools and tricks from dplyr so um, the question again is what, what is the latest that we can expect a frost in the spring and so a frost is any temperature below zero so to break this down a bit i'm going to go ahead and write up what we call pseudocode and so the first thing i want to do is and i'm going to put these as comments because later i might want to come back in intermix code or i might want to intermix other ideas here so i need to determine um, whether a low temperature was below freezing, right? So uh, in degrees Celsius, if it's below zero, it's freezing, okay? Um, I need to then, uh, a low temperature for the day, right? So we have every day from 1891 to present. So we wanna look at every day and tell us whether or not that temperature is below freezing. And then we wanna aggregate the data by month and year, uh, month and day, sorry. So for every day of the year, we wanna know what fraction of years was there a freezing temperature on that day. So the third question then is to determine the fraction of years that a month day pairing had a frost. And then finally, uh, we want to find the day, is it in May? Um, where we're, um, where there's below a five or 10% risk of uh, another frost, okay? So this is our pseudocode. And anytime I'm trying to take on something that's a little bit more complicated than a one line chunk of code, I like to put up an outline there because it really helps me to organize my thoughts and I always encourage others to do the same. Uh, it's kind of like writing a paper that we like to start out with an outline so we can then go back and flush it out to make the problem easier because looking at a blank page on your computer is, is pretty overwhelming, right? All right, so we're going to start with this and we know how to do nearly everything here, okay? We're going to add one new thing, which is the mutate function, and we'll see something special about using logicals as we go through this. So the first function we're going to talk about is mutate. Now mutate allows us to either change an existing column or add a new column. Okay. So if we want to make a new column that says, um, is it below freezing? Well, we can use that, do that with the mutate function. Okay. So we're going to do AA weather, and I'll pipe that then into mutate to create a column or a variable called below freezing. And that then is going to be equal to is the T min lower than zero? Okay, so we'll say T min less than zero. So as I was looking around at other websites, uh, some websites said, well, is it going to be a soft freeze or a hard freeze or a severe freeze, right? So they might use different demarcations for defining those different levels of freezes. But for now, if it's below zero, I'm going to consider that a freeze, a frost. Okay. So in this syntax, T min less than zero is going to give me one of three different values, either a true because it's below zero, a false because it's zero or higher, or an NA. So an NA would happen if, uh, say something happened with the thermometer that day at the weather station, and it, for some reason, didn't record a uh, T min value. And so it would be NA because meh, we don't know what it was. Okay. So if we run these two lines of code, we now see that we get an extra column at the right-hand side of this data frame called below freezing. And we see under that in the, the brackets, the angled brackets, LGL, which is short for logical. Okay. So one of the nice things about working with logicals is that they also can have a numeric value. And so uh, I don't know how you remember this or some mnemonic, I'm sure there's something, uh, but false has the value of zero and true has the value of one. I think of 
false as kind of like a form of nothingness, right? So if someone's lying to you and everything they say is false, they're like a nothing, right? They're kind of an empty suit. Uh, so empty, zero, right? Whereas truth is wholeness, right? That if we have truth in our life, then we have completion. And one uh, is a symbol perhaps of completion for you, okay? So we can also do this in R, uh, if we forget that philosophical rant, <laughs> um, we could create a vector with a series of true and false values. So down here in the console, I'm gonna say my vector, uh, and I'll say true, false, true, false, true, okay? So then my vector has a series of trues and falses. And so it's important to remember that these trues and falses don't have quotes around them. If they had quotes around them, then they'd be strings and they wouldn't so easily be considered a logical value. Okay. So I can use, to demonstrate their numerical value, I can use a function called as.numeric. as.numeric, my vector. And you can see that those trues were turned into ones and the falses were turned into zeros, which is pretty, pretty sweet, right? Because we can now use my vector, that vector of trues and falses, or um, below freezing, and other functions that normally take numeric data, the ones I usually use would be sum and mean, and I use those frequently with logical data. So sum is going to add up all the values, and that will tell you how many values are true. So if I do sum my vector, we get three, right? Now, what would mean be, right? Well, mean would be the average or the mean of all those zeros and ones. And that would tell you the fraction of the values in my vector that are true, okay? So that's pretty useful, right? That's pretty slick. Uh, and again, it's something that we can utilize going forward. And so, you know, again, we could think of some my vector, say we forgot about the mean function, uh, divided by length my vector to get the same thing, right? But mean is a lot easier. Uh, and, in, and if you do have an NA value, then I believe the, the mean function will, we'll see, will we'll perform a little bit better anyway. Okay, so let's go back to our example and let's add to the end of this a summarize. Summarize uh, frac below freezing equals mean below freezing and we get an NA value, all right? So as I mentioned, this is where we get into the problem of having uh, NA values in our logical vectors. And so an NA value, we don't, R doesn't know what to make of that in the mean function. So if you look within the help documentation for sum and mean, you'll see that there's an argument you could use called NA.RM. And we can add to the arguments of mean NA dot rm equals true. And what this means is before you calculate the mean, remove those NA values, okay? So it won't count in the numerator or the denominator. And so if we remove N the NAs, then we see about 35% of the days between now and October of 1891, there was a freezing temperature, right? So this is Northeast, this is Southeastern Michigan. <laughs> um, it gets cold here in the winter and, and that, that makes a lot of sense, right? So, but we don't want to know the total fraction of days that where it was cold, where it was below freezing. We want to know for, for today, uh, May 21st, um, you know, what fraction of days or what fraction of years on May 21st has there been a frost, okay? Because I want to know, do I need to keep worrying about whether or not there's going to be a freeze? And so I can then add to this, like we've seen in previous code clubs, a group by function to say group by a year, I'm sorry, group by month and day. Ah, it says it doesn't know month. Why doesn't it know month? Let's see. A, a weather, well it should know month, group by month, day. Ah, 
So it doesn't, ha it doesn't know the month because I still have my summarize function in here, right? So I need to put my group by before the summarize function. Throw that, and now we're, now we're doing it. So let me make this window a little bit bigger. And we see that in the first column, we have the month, the second column, the day, and the third column is the fraction of years where it was below freezing. So on January 1st, we see that 93% of the time, we have a low temperature below freezing. That makes a lot of sense, right? So I'm interested in May because that's when things start to warm up uh, here in southeastern Michigan. And so if I want to look at May, hopefully you're saying with me, ah, uh, we need to use the filter function. So we'll so say filter month equals five for the fifth month being May. And we can then see uh, those rows for the month of May. Great. Well, May's got 31 days, I think. <laughs> um, if I want to see all of the rows for that month, for that data frame, I can say print n equals 31. And it will then output data for all days of the month, right? And we can see that early uh, in the month, so like May 1st, there's about an 8.7% uh, risk of a frost, right? So 8.7% of previous years had a frost on May 1st, right? And so that's about, that's close to 10%, right? And certainly if we think about anything after May 1st, well, then that gets pretty big too, right? So if we look at these, um, we might start thinking about, you know, if you kind of think about a cumulative risk that in the month of May, things get um, a little bit better as we go uh, down the year, uh, down the month, sorry. And that, you know, once we get past the 21st, there's never been a frost, right? There's never been a frost on the 22nd through 31st. And, um, you know, if we kind of tick backwards, and get to a point where maybe, you know, we're willing to accept, say, like a 5% uh, chance of a frost, then we're probably coming back to um, about, I don't know, so that's like one, two, uh, four, five. So we're probably waiting until like the 13th or so to stop worrying about a frost. So if, if, we get to the 13th and there's maybe only a 5% risk that we'll have a frost uh, the rest of May. Um, and so uh, that's encouraging. <laughs> um, perhaps if, you know, if we're willing to be a little bit more risky, uh, if we went to the 10th, then maybe we would, um, we would only have a 10% risk of a frost later in the year. And certainly, certainly if I went to that gardening in the mitten web website, uh, they would tell us that May's, uh, that the Ann Arbor spring frost should end by May 10th, which largely agrees with what we've got, right? So if we want to be a little bit more cautious, we might wait to the 13th, so we only have a 5% risk, but, you know, we could maybe move things up a little bit to the 10th, uh, um, and so then we'd only have like a 10% risk of things to worry about there, okay? So we could certainly make a plot of the whole entire year to see what's going on there. That's going to require a few extra steps uh, that using things like Lubridate and ggplot that we're not quite ready for yet. So in a future code club, we'll cover how to do that, how we might turn these probabilities into a plot showing the risk of a frost on any given day um, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a plot going forward. We could also think about cumulative risk, right? So here we're showing the daily risk of a frost, but certainly, uh, you know, if someone, if there's a risk of a frost on the first, then it's perhaps, I don't know, likely that the next day might also be a frost, right? So then you have an added risk as you go through. So that's another function that we'll talk about in a future code club called CUMSUM, C-U-M-S-U-M. -S All right. So hopefully you now feel a little bit more comfortable about using the filter function, the group by function, and the summarize function, along with some of these arithmetic functions like mean and, and sum. Um, but also this new function we've talked about called mutate, which allows us to create new columns or to replace existing columns. As we go forward, 
uh, we'll see how we can use these in more interesting settings to answer some provocative or uh, boring or just silly questions that we could have pulled up from another website. But at least I own this result now, right? Like, and so I always feel like that's empowering, that I can pick a date based on the risk that I'm willing to accept, not some website was willing to accept for me. All right, so go ahead and pause the video now, engage with the exercises that I've given you, and then after we come back, I'll go through these answers with you and we'll see whether or not we get the same result. Hopefully you found those exercises engaging and learned something more about analyzing our data with R to answer a real practical question, albeit a question we could have gotten by just a simple Google search. Anyway, the first question was, when do we expect the vegetables in our garden to stop growing? So to answer this, I'm gonna go ahead and copy the code chunk that we had above. And instead of looking at May, because that's the start of the growing season, I'm gonna to look towards the end of the growing season. And so let's start with September because there are some cold days uh, in September. I'm not sure that they're necessarily frosts. So if we run that, run that code chunk and look, we see that uh, maybe in one year out of the past 130, there's been a frost on September 1st, but really nothing to speak of until you know, we get to like the 22nd or so. Now, if I want to be confident that there won't be any more growth, then maybe I want to look more at like a 90% chance of a frost having happened. So I'm going to go ahead and now look into October. And again, we can look at October or any month we want by changing that uh, month parameter. And so here we see that, um, you know, looking at the fraction of days below freezing for each day of October, that, you know, if we got around the 18th, you know, then we're kind of getting to the point where maybe 90% there's in the previous days, there's been about a 90% chance of a frost, uh, accumulative chance. Okay. And so, um, if again, if our garden makes it to the 18th, um, that's about as far as we think it'll go because after that, then we're basically guaranteed to have either already had a frost, um, at, at that point. Okay. So, if you can get from May 10th to October 18th, it's about five months here in Michigan, you're doing really well for your garden. You know, it's a, it seems like a really short growing season. Um, and certainly for me, uh, growing animals on a pasture where I need the grass to grow, I probably need even warmer temperatures. So let's look at that um, question in the second question. So the second question that we wanna deal with is how many days in Ann Arbor have a temperature greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So this is a little bit of a different question because we need to make a new column, right? We're not gonna be dealing with the is, is uh, below freezing column. We need to make a new temperature, a new temperature column that isn't in Celsius, but is in Fahrenheit, right? I could have turned 90 into Celsius, but that kind of defeats the purpose of this exercise. <laughs> so I will come up here and do a weather and pipe that into a new column called mutate, uh, mutate with, with mutate. And I will call this T max uh, F uh, as opposed to what we had was T max in Celsius. And the conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit is nine uh, divided by five times uh, the degrees in Celsius plus 32. So I run that. I see I knew, have a new column here which is the max, the high temperature in degrees Fahrenheit over on the, the right side of the column. But now I'm gonna do very much what I had done uh, before with group by and summarize. Now I wanna know for each year, um, what is the probability of having a temperature greater than 90 degrees? And um, so I'm gonna create another column here, which I'll just call 
is hot because that's hot for me. <laughs> so we'll say is hot and we'll say T max F greater than 90. And so now we have um, uh, an indication in our columns here of whether or not the temperature for each day was hot, at least by my standards. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is for each year, I want to know how many days was it hot. And I'll pipe this then to a group by, group by year. And then with a group by, I then generally do a summarize. And we will then do um, total hot days. And for this, we'll use the sum function. And remember, a sum over a logical vector adds up all those zeros and ones to get you a total number of true values, right? So we're summing up the number of times that is hot is true. So we'll say sum is hot. And again, we're going to want to include that na.rm equals true to remove those na values. And so now what I have is for each year, the number of days where it was above 90 degrees. Now, I don't have um, complete years worth of data for 1891 or 2020. So I want to remove those. So I'll do filter year greater than 1891 and year less than 2020. Okay. Now, this is the total number of hot days per year. I want to know the average number of hot days per year. So I can then pipe this into another summarize function to do summarize um, av hot days mean uh, total hot days. Okay, so we see on average in Ann Arbor, there's about 9.4 days where the temperature is above 90 degrees. Okay, uh, you could do more, and you could perhaps plot this as a histogram. We'll talk about those concepts in another code club. But if we wanted to look at a higher temperature, say like 95, how many days over 95 do we have here in southeastern Michigan? Generally, about one or two days. Um, above 95 and let's see 98 maybe every other year at one one in every four years we have a day over 99 and similarly for 100 degrees it's it just doesn't get that hot thank goodness man uh, that'd be brutal i don't know how people in the south do it so again this is helping us to see on average how many days would we have greater than 90 degrees. Again, the principles and the kind of the order and flow of the functions is very similar to answering this question as to the question of, you know, when is the earliest frost and what is the, the fall frost uh, date, okay? So let's try this again now with a different question, which is based on a rule of thumb that I recently heard on social media, that if you add the low temperature and the high temperature for the day, and the temperature is above um, 100 degrees, then grass will grow. Okay, so again, I have sheep and cows that are out on pasture, and I need the grass to grow because hay is really expensive, and I just I just love the look of uh, puffy white sheep uh, out on pasture, or my son's black and white belted Galloways out on pasture too. So, when can we get them on pasture? When can we expect the grass to start growing? Okay, so again, this sounds a lot like the frost date question, right? But we're going to use a slightly different mutate function that looks kind of like the one we just did in the second exercise. I hope you see that uh, these questions are all related and they do build on each other. So we'll do another mutate. And so I'm going to convert my min and my max temperatures from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And we then want to create a column that says, is that... Uh, sum of those two greater than 100. So I'll do T max F, and I'll do 9 divided by 5 times T max plus 32. I'll do T min F, 9 divided by 5 times T min plus 32. Oh, that should be a comma, not a period. So let's see what that looks like. So it's upset with me. Oh, because I put an equal sign instead of a plus sign. I make a lot of typos too. So we now see that we have those two extra columns. I'm going to go ahead and add a column um, that I'll call, 
I'll call is growing grass grass growing maybe and we'll say t max f plus t min f greater than 100 so again if those two added together is greater than 100 the rule of thumb goes that it's the grass is growing and um, we can see here that uh, these first dates of our our data frame uh, suggest that um, here in October that we have grass growing um, at um, just over 100 degrees, right? So again, we want to aggregate this data to look at whether or not or when, when the grass starts growing, okay? And so like we did with the frost dates, we're going to go ahead and group by uh, month and day. And we'll then summarize um, frac growing days to be the mean of grass growing. Okay. And again, we've got NA values in there. Uh, so I need to go ahead and add that NA.RM equals true to get the you know fraction of years where we've had, you know, theoretically a, a growing day. And so we see that maybe um, one or two days, or I guess maybe about five days in early January, we've had temperatures warm enough for grass growth. Michigan weather is very unpredictable and very erratic. Um, but in general, as they say, April showers bring May flowers. That's another one of these rules of thumb or heuristics. Is that true? I don't know. Uh, maybe probably not so much in Michigan. Um, so if we then do print, or let's do filter month, equals five and then print n equals 31. Again, this code chunk here is almost identical to the code chunk for looking at the frost dates. The difference is which what we're doing to mutate, you know, what kind of column are we creating and what logical question are we asking? Otherwise, this framework is identical to what we had done for um, the, the frost dates. So I hope you can see that and that this general uh, structure to the code can be adapted to be to answer many questions as we've seen already in this code club. So if we look at this, then we see at the beginning of the year, beginning of May, there's about a 70% chance each day of grass growth. But, you know, we don't really have reliable grass growth, uh, according to this heuristic, until probably maybe like the 23rd of May or so, okay? Um, and similarly, we could, uh, we could also look at the end of the year by changing this month uh, to 10 perhaps and seeing, you know, when do we stop getting reliable grass growth? Well, it's probably at the end of September, right? Um, and that temperatures really cool down. Uh, and so we could maybe look at September instead. Okay. And so we see, yeah, that like, you know, the, you know, 90% of years on the 24th of September, we still have grass growth temperatures. Um, and after that, you know, the probability starts falling off. Of course, if you know anything about grasses, our pastures, there are different types of grasses that do well at different temperatures. And so this, again, is a heuristic, a rule of thumb that um, would be interesting to correlate with soil temperature, um, which is another variable that's in uh, these data sets. And so perhaps we could we could evaluate this heuristic to see if that uh, T min plus T max being over 100 degrees Fahrenheit matches with agronomy data or soil temperature data um, and to look at the different types of grasses that grow at different temperatures. But again, eh, <laughs> that's a lot of work. Uh, and so hopefully you've seen here in this code club uh, what we can do with a few lines of code and a question. Thanks again for joining me for this week's Code Club. Be sure that you take time to engage with the exercises to strengthen your skills and to continue to practice. Even better would be for you to ask your own question using this data set to answer a question that's relevant to you, whether that's getting data uh, that's for your local area, or again, asking a question that makes you curious. Um, please engage the material. I'd love to hear what you're trying to do by leaving a comment down in the comments. If you run into a hurdle, 
let me know what it was. I'm sure there'll be other people that are having the same challenge, and I'd love to cover that in a future Code Club and perhaps take on the question that you were trying to answer to help others to learn R better. Keep practicing, uh, and if you've enjoyed this, please be sure to tell your friends about these Code Club videos. Um, like the video to help others find it. Please subscribe to the Riffamonas channel here, and then also click on the bell so that you're notified when the next Code Club video is released. I'm releasing these every Thursday at noon, so for, look for the next one on May 28th around lunchtime. Until then, keep practicing, stay safe, and take care.